Thanks, Etienne. Um, this is a paper I decided to present um, um, after we selected the poster because there was nothing on juries and we have a poster with uh, the 12 angry men, so... Um, <laughs> just, uh, to sort of substantiate uh, and give some legitimacy to the poster. Um, but more seriously, uh, this comes from a, a, a sort of longer and more torturous reflection that I'm having on the question of jury deliberation. So for those of you ha who, who read the paper or had time to go through the paper, um, what I really care about is the second part uh, that has to do with jury deliberation and I care less about the first part which is sort of free uh, thinking about uh, how a jury system uh, would ideally look like um, if we follow the uh, aggregate, what I call in the paper the aggregative justification of, um, of the juries. Now, there are different ways of justifying the jury as an institution. Um, um, one way to go about it is the sort of Tocquevillian way uh, to say that it cultivates civic competence. Um, that is not, that is sort of the standard way in a way, but that is not um, the kind of justification that I'm interested in in this paper. The distinct justification I'm interested in is the epistemic justification. Uh, and according to that justification, the rough idea is that juries work as truth finders. And so there are two strategies for substantiating the claim that juries are truth finders. One is what I call aggregative, uh, and it roughly follows um, the Condorcet jury theorem uh, logic. And the other one is the deliberative logic. Um, whereby uh, juries, uh, on the basis of a certain uh, uh, process of deliberation, uh, and in virtue of that process of deliberation, tend to generate uh, a better decision. I call the first strategy the aggregative strategy, and the second strategy the deliberative uh, strategy. Uh, and what I'm trying to argue, or explore rather in the paper, is the thought that on both views, so if you're either an aggregativist about the epistemic justification uh, of juries or a deliberativist uh, about the epistemic justification of juries, you have good reasons to prefer uh, a system, so an institutional setup with multiple juries uh, as opposed to an institutional setup where you have uh, single juries. Now I have to say something about what I mean by juries. By juries I mean typically criminal juries, so I'm not going to talk about civil uh, the civil cases, um, and I'm mostly going to focus on, or at least in the paper I focus on, the empirical evidence that is given by uh, research conducted mostly in the US, because that's where the research is, um, especially on the part on, uh, on, on deliberation. Um, and, and so what I'm going to do now, uh, in the time that I have, is to, to tell you why if you support an aggregative view of, of uh, epistemic justification of the, of the criminal jury, basically, uh, you would go with multiple juries rather than single juries, and why, uh, given the way in which uh, the jury decision-making process looks right now, you have good reasons to go with what I call uh, multiple and mi procedurally mixed um, uh, systems of, uh, of, of, of juries. Now, in the... Um, before going, coming to that, I want to, to make an observation that about the fact that um, we do resort to multiple groups uh, for taking decisions in our other settings. So for example, if you think about uh, focus groups in social research, uh, typically the way that happens is that you have multiple groups that researchers rely on, and typically they rely on them in order to increase <coughs> both the accuracy of their findings and the Exhaustive, exhaustivity of their uh, findings. Uh, we also resort to mixed uh, procedures or mixed methods in social science um, <coughs> for the same kind of reasons. We want our <coughs> findings to be robust findings. Um, and more anecdotally, we have that in mathematics. So for any of you who have taken, uh, who have done elementary math, we know there are two uh, there are at least uh, two ways of solving a mathematical problem or you know, there are sometimes more than one way to solving a mathematical problem and, and one way of checking whether we did the, the math correctly is to try to solve it uh, in, a, in another way. So the, the sort of general logic of, uh, of the argument is that um, 
different kinds of methods that are in some sense legitimate for taking a certain kind of decision and different groups for taking that same decision will provide you with epistemically more robust decision than uh, one method and one body for deciding that. Um, now, when it comes to the aggregative case, uh, it's really sort of, again, daydreaming about how a system of uh, juries would look like under the hypothetical conditions where we'd have an unlimited budget and so we could afford, and we would have the sort of legitimacy conditions in place, we could afford a system uh, that would look like the Athenian system, uh, where we'd have uh, bodies of 200 or so jurors for, studying, uh, for, for examining misdemeanor cases, and, um, uh, and big, way bigger bodies for, uh, for, for judging uh, serious uh, criminal wrongs. Um, and what I'm trying to argue in the paper is to say that we even on the aggregative logic that roughly follows the Condorcet jury theorem, uh, we have good reasons to prefer a system of multiple juries to a single uh, indefinitely big uh, Athenian-like uh, jury. And the reason for that is, uh, the reason that I sort of hang on in the paper is the phenomenon of epistemic free writing. Um, so there will be a tendency in a super big uh, body for individual, individuals, a rational tendency, uh, to epistemically free ride on, uh, on others. Um, now there's some uh, formal uh, stuff on the question of epistemic free riding. There's a very interesting paper by Christian List and uh, Petit uh, on the question of epistemic free riding in the context of uh, juries. Um, and roughly the argument for epistemic free writing goes like this. The, 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 you, you can have, I think, uh, two forms or, or two, if you want, mechanisms for explaining why epistemic free writing would happen. Um, one would be a sort of a bad faith mechanism and the other one a good faith uh, mechanism. On the bad faith uh, mechanism, the idea is that for each individual in a jury body, uh, imagine a big, uh, a big jury body, the act of judging uh, requires investment of uh, rare uh, cognitive resources. Um, and it is rational for any individual within the body to invest um, as little as possible if the individual has reasons to believe that basically the rest of the group is going to take care of the job. Um, so on this rational choice model, we treat good judgment of the group as a sort of a collective good that has some sort of spillover uh, effects. Um, and that is going to be provided even if uh, the individual, from the perspective of the individual, will not invest in the uh, collective good. So individually, it is rationally uh, for, uh, for each one not to invest or to invest considerably less in the collective good. Um, which in this case would be uh, good uh, judgment. Um, and so there are some sort of formal models showing that sometimes because of this phenomenon, when everyone reasons like this, um, the bigger the size of the group, then uh, the, 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 the worse the decision epistemically will be. Um, there are uh, some formal models and also there's a 2017 article studying this in an experimental setting and, and actually showing that uh, what they call uh, epistemic competence, but I don't think that's exactly right. It's more like epistemic performance. So the degree to which you decide to invest your epistemic competence in, uh, in, in improving the accuracy of the decision uh, drops uh, from groups that are roughly around three to groups that are uh, roughly around seven uh, in a uh, significant way. Now, I'm not saying that that is bound to happen uh, in the case of the jury, but I'm, I'm I do believe that we can imagine that there is a size uh, where, uh, where of the jury where will that ep kind of epistemic uh, free writing uh, will happen. And that will give us, I'm, I'm going to come back to the point, that will give us good reasons for breaking down the big body into smaller bodies in order to avoid uh, epistemic writing, free writing in that sense. Um, the second good faith uh, explanation or uh, uh, causal mechanism of work in epistemic free writing is the one uh, explored by uh, Petit and List uh, in a 2003 uh, chapter uh, on Karl Popper. Um, and uh, it's actually quite a fun uh, chapter to read. Uh, they say, well, imagine that uh, everyone believed in the uh, Condorcet jury theorem and uh, you know, every juror out there in the, in, in the jury thinks that the conditions are 
satisfied so that the uh, Condorcet jury theorem uh, obtains. Uh, if every individual juror thinks that, and given the way in which jury decision making is actually currently set up, that is, we vote and we see what uh, the others are voting, and so voting is transparent, we're going to have this sort of cascade effects whereby if you're the fourth or the fifth juror in a row uh, and people are voting, it will be on the Condorcet jury theorem, you would have good reasons to go with the majority rather than uh, resort or on your own independent uh, judgment, especially if that judgment is in conflict with whatever the majority is saying. Uh, and so the suggestion that Petit and Liszt have in the paper is to sort of create a, an institutional setup where, where jurors refrain from giving their conclusive verdict uh, on the case, while at the same time giving some information uh, about the way in which they evaluate the evidence. Um, and I just think that doesn't hold at all, uh, because it, it, it's, it will be very, very difficult to sort of separate between the sort of your views on, on, on secondary aspects of the case and your conclusive uh, views uh, on the case. And just the risk of betraying your position are going to be uh, too, too big. Um, and so my suggestion is, uh, like either in the rational choice uh, scenario or in the good, uh, good faith scenario that uh, Petit and Liszt draw, that we have good reasons to go with multiple juries. But by multiple juries, I mean different things. In the sort of breaking down the big Athenian jury uh, uh, into smaller uh, groups, the, the reason is that uh, we will have to settle with multiple juries that in some sense draw on the epistemic properties of aggregation, but at a slower pace, as it were. Uh, and we sort of end uh, at levels where uh, epistemic free writing would happen. Now, what those levels are is an empirical matter. Uh, so again, this is a highly hypothetical case. Uh, and in the, um, in the uh, list and petit scenario, uh, my suggestion is that we would uh, sort of break the existing jury into provisional sub-juries that we would uh, allocate in specific ways. Uh, in a way that, uh, for example, increases the heterogeneity of the views of the jurors that are going to sort of uh, decide and deliberate in the smaller committees. And then the committees are going to come back into the bigger jury and discuss about the case in a way that uh, avoids uh, the cascade effects at the level of a small jury. But this is not what I care about. Uh, so that's the sort of aggregative view. On the deliberative view, and this is the th stuff that I really care about, um, there is good evidence to show that there is no uh, systematic way in which, in the way in which jury decision actually happens today, mostly in the US. Uh, jury deliberation is, uh, on the whole, epistemically more effective than a simple aggregative procedure. Um, now, this might sound surprising, but I, I think that there is enough evidence that, that substantiates that. Uh, and so the argument is we have an epistemic equivalence on the whole and ex ante between a purely aggregative procedure, so people just vote, and then there is a verdict based on a majority or supermajority rule, and a case of jury deliberation where, where jurors deliberate uh, uh, about the case, uh, and then you have uh, a verdict that is decided collectively. Um, and there is ample evidence to show that uh, Jury deliberation does not necessarily perform better than aggregation uh, in, in different respects. Um, so jury deliberation sometimes improves, but sometimes actually alters in a negative way uh, the reasoning skills of, of jurors. That would be the first uh, level. The second level is that jury deliberation is sometimes good at identifying um, uh, accurate evidence or deceit, but sometimes it's bad at doing it. Um, Jury deliberation is sometimes good at dismissing inadmissible evidence, but sometimes bad at it. And so all uh, jury deliberation sometimes is good at offsetting biases and sometimes bad. And the fifth level is uh, the fact that jury deliberation is sometimes good in improving the quality of the memory of, of jurors about the evidence pre presented uh, during the trial proceedings, but sometimes bad and actually can have distorting uh, uh, effects. Um, so the, the worry there is that if we favor a system where jury deliberation is a sort of mandatory and unique procedure whereby verdicts are decided, uh, we will have verdicts that are uh, epi epistemically suboptimal in a way 
um, uh, in a way that is undesirable. And, and they are epistemically uh, suboptimal insofar as the verdicts that are going to be decided via deliberation um, are going to be verdicts that are pushed by things like social pressure and informational pressure uh, and are not going to be decided for uh, the right uh, epistemic reasons. Um, and so the idea is that if we want to avoid that, uh, one way to avoid that, one way to avoid what I call uh, epistemically inflated uh, verdicts, inflated by the fact that they are not uh, epistemically uh, covered but rather driven by this uh, phenomena that are uh, social pressure or informational pressure, one way to uh, avoid that is to introduce in parallel to uh, juries that decide via jury deliberation, a jury that simply decides on an aggregative procedure um, at the same time. Uh, there are different scenarios that I sort of explore in the paper. One in responding and tackling the, the, the epistemic deficits of, of jury deliberation. One is to say, well, <clears throat> we can simply improve deliberation in different kinds of ways. Uh, by creating virtual, uh, virtual avatars of deliberation rooms, and that those are actually proposals that are on the table right now. Um, that is an interesting proposal, but uh, most likely it's not going to happen anytime soon. So in the meantime, as a transitional measure, the idea is that we have two options. Uh, either we have a system of multiple juries, uh, so juries that are uh, deciding based purely on an aggregative uh, procedure, and juries that are deciding on a jury deliberation procedure. Um, and that can be uh, realized in any case where we have a system of two or more juries uh, where we have an even number of juries. So two juries is enough for having that sort of multiple uh, procedurally mixed system. Um, and the other cheaper option, uh, in a way, would be to randomize uh, the decision procedure um, so basically decide uh, on the basis of lottery whether the case is going to be decided on the basis of aggregation or on the basis of deliberation. One virtue of that is that we can move from a sort of a social laboratory uh, uh, setting to a real life setting and see whether actually uh, the two procedures are epistemically uh, equivalent or not. And at the end, I sort of uh, tried to do a little ballet on the way in which that, uh, <laughs> that would connect to democracy. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that now. So I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting any comments, critiques, or feedback on the, especially, I mean, obviously, you're free to uh, pull any, uh, in any place of the, the, the argument that you want. But I'm especially interested on the jury deliberation uh, part of the paper. Thank, thanks, André, for your paper. So uh, I think I'll limit myself to, to a few comments so that we have a good amount of time for, uh, for the Q&A. Uh, but, but I will try to say a little bit about, um, about uh, each of the three parts of the paper. So I have to say that I found that uh, very important parts of your argument actually rest on the first section, uh, the section on, on aggregation. So I may spend uh, some time discussing, um, discussing this um, section maybe a bit more time than, than the two other ones. So uh, my first comments will focus on uh, voter competence and epistemic free writing, what you define as epistemic free writing. Uh, so uh, in the first part of the, pepper you argue in, uh, of, the, of the paper, you argue in favor of a multiple jury scheme by relying on the uh, Condorcet jury theorem. Uh, so this may come as a surprise to, uh, to the reader, given that uh, some epistemic Democrats have, uh, have argued that the jury theorem is irrelevant uh, when it comes to assessing uh, the epistemic value of uh, collective decision making. Uh, of course, you seem very well aware of this in the paper, and uh, you explicitly try to refute some of the objections that have been uh, directed against the uh, Condorcet jury theorem. One of the main uh, critiques of uh, this theorem is that it assumes that uh, individual, individual voters are uh, better than random, but uh, that it is very unclear that we actually have reason to believe that uh, they are. Now, in the paper, you try to refute this objection by claiming that uh, those who formulate it fail to see that the Condorcet jury theorem can be realized even under conditions where only the average juror, as distinct from each, uh, as distinct from each individual juror, uh, has an epistemic competence that is above the 50-person threshold. And if the 
uh, uh, jurors' competence is normally distributed uh, around the average. Uh, but I found this, rep this response to be, to be a little bit too uh, quick, as you, you do not really give us reason to believe in the paper uh, that it is indeed the case that the average juror has an epistemic competence that is above the 50% uh, the, the, the <laughs> threshold. So uh, my first question is quite simple. Do we have strong <coughs> reasons to believe that the average juror is above uh, this, this threshold? Uh, after all, in the second paper, you mentioned that uh, biases and stereotypes may enter the jury's uh, decision-making process, and I was worrying while, uh, while reading your paper that such biases and stereotypes may make it so that uh, the conditions necessary for the, the jury theorem to hold uh, may not obtain. So I have a, another comment on the first section of the paper, but it's, it's essentially clarificatory uh, in, in nature. So in the first section, when, when speaking of uh, Athenian-sized uh, single juries, you worry that large, jury, uh, large juries will make it rational for uh, individual jurors to engage in epistemic free riding, and uh, that is to stop giving due epistemic attention to their decision, to their own decision, and to start free riding on the judgment of uh, the majority. So your solution to this problem is a system with multiple juries uh, that, in your view, would prevent free riding problems that would occur uh, in a big, a big single jury system in an Athenian uh, sized jury. But I was wondering uh, how exactly does a system with uh, multiple juries prevent free riding? Uh, is it not likely that even if juries are divided in a certain number of small juries, they will know that there are other juries uh, and that the final decision of the jury they belong to is not that important or at least not as important as if the fate of the defendant depended on nothing else than the decision of their jury. Uh, so can we not <coughs> hypothesize that uh, a system with multiple juries will also lead to some extent uh, to the problem of epistemic free writing? So that's uh, for the first part of the paper. I'll move on to, to the second. Um, so in the second part of the paper, you, you explain that findings about the epistemic effectiveness of jury deliberation, not aggregation, uh, are mixed. And in your view, this warrants the claim that deliberation should not have the special procedural position it enjoys, uh, it enjoys today in jury systems. So I won't comment on your interpretation of the numerous findings you describe uh, in this section. Uh, you definitely know uh, this uh, literature way more than me. But I'd like to focus on the possible reforms uh, that you propose at the end uh, of the section. So one of your interesting suggestions is to randomize uh, the choice of the decision-making procedure between a purely aggregative and a deliberative procedure. After all, you argue, when our reasons for making a decision are relevantly underdetermined, uh, randomization provides an impartial and fair procedure for making such a decision. So I would have two questions about this idea. First, I found that at this point of the paper, you've shown yourself to be fairly optimistic about the likelihood that the Condorcet jury theorem uh, will hold, and therefore about, um, uh, about the, that the epistemic effectiveness of uh, aggregative decision-making procedures. On the other hand, you have quoted many studies that give us reason to think that at least some kinds of deliberative decision-making procedures are epistemically suboptimal, to use your expression. So my first question would be, why keep deliberative decision-making procedures in the picture at all? So do we have properly epistemic reasons to do so? I'm guessing that we have, but I'd just like to hear a little bit more about this. So my second question about randomization comes from the fact that in the first two parts of the paper, you do not consider the reasons in general we have to choose a specific decision-making procedure over others. But as you recognize yourself in the paper and also in the talk, uh, you only consider properly epistemic reasons. But I was wondering if we may not have non-epistemic reasons, maybe moral reasons, uh, to resist randomization. So let's say that we knew in a specific case where we're about to randomize the choice of a decision procedure, uh, that the defendant has a strong preference for one type of procedure over the other. So would this give us uh, a non-epistemic reason to resist randomization and maybe grant the defendant her wish? Uh, you mentioned in the paper that defendants could not reasonably object that their case is decided on the basis of aggregation instead of deliberation or the other way around as these procedures are epistemically equivalent in your eyes. But I suspect that uh, in at least some cases, the defendant would have a preference anyway. So you may think that this preference is irrational or at least non-epistemically justified, but it would still be, after all, her preference. So this is just one example in which we may think that we have non-epistemic reasons to resist randomization. Uh, as, uh, and you may, after all, think that defendants should have no say 
in the choice of the decision procedure that is going to find them guilty or innocent. Uh, but I wanted to use the example to ask you a kind of more general question. So if I reformulate, is it not possible that at least in some cases, non-epistemic reasons are going to come into play and convince us to choose ourselves a decision procedure over the other instead of randomizing the choice? Yep. So uh, this leads me to the last section of your paper where you consider you actually consider very shortly non-epistemic reasons that may lead us to support a, syst uh, a system with multiple juries. So in your view, there are properly democratic reasons to support such a scheme, uh, one of which relates to participation and the other to diversity. So this section is very short. My question will also be very short. So when you say that a system with multiple juries would lead to a more inclusive and active involvement of lay citizens in the criminal justice system, this makes it sound like you're committed to the claim that such an active involvement is intrinsically good uh, from a moral point of view. And I was wondering if I'm right to think that you're committed to this claim uh, or if not. And, and when you say, second, uh, second uh, short question, when you say that the multiple jury system is one that cultivate more diversity in the way we think uh, uh, and go about solving our collective problems, this makes it sound like you're once again considering epistemic rather than non-epistemic reasons in favor, in favor of uh, system with multiple juries. After all, epistemic democrat, uh, Democrats have argued uh, in favor of uh, the epistemic, uh, the epistemic uh, beneficial consequences of diversity. Uh, so I was wondering if diversity can really be understood, uh, considered to be a democratic, albeit non-epistemic, uh, reason to support a system with multiple juries, or, or if it's just uh, another kind of uh, epistemic reason. So I think I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you again for the, yeah. the very uh, interesting yeah. read, I have to say. Thanks. Uh, it's okay. G good stuff. Uh, so I will just take them in order. Um, actually, I will start with your third. So I, ha I have four, four, four uh, questions on giving the, the defendants uh, her or his option over the two procedures. Yeah. Uh, there is an ancestor paper where I argue that we should turn jury deliberation into a waivable right okay. of the defendant. Um, people have reacted in, in very different ways to, to, to that argument, uh, and it has been considered to be a wacky argument. Uh, so uh, I did not include it, but that would be, so the, the, the way in which the argument is presented in, in the paper is to say, well, look, if you really buy the case of the two procedures being epistemically equivalent, then uh, some things might follow procedurally uh, in terms of institutional design. One thing would be to say, well, we improve deliberation up to a point where epistemic equivalence is not uh, any longer the case. So deliberation is better than, uh, than pure aggregation. Uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon because uh, sort of the technology that we would need for that and uh, conditions of legitimacy uh, would, would, would sort of impede that in, in, in the, in the like, midterm run. Um, and then you have these two other options, multiple juries and, right. and, and, and randomization. So I could include something like waivability on, on, on the list. On the list. Um, this is to say that I'm, I'm, I'm quite sensitive to this particular, uh, particular view, giving the, uh, the defendant the choice and then, then giving the, the defendant to, the option to randomize uh, the choice uh, himself or herself. Uh, if that is epistemically better than, than sort of just taking a, 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 an arbitrary uh, choice. So that's the, the third point. On the conditions of re realization of, uh, of the, the Condorcet jury theorem about, about individual competence, um, my answer would be, I think, Ellen's answer in democratic reason, in a way, uh, which is, do we have reasons to believe that actually these guys are uh, ep individually epistemically uh, competent in a way that grants one of the assumptions of the, of the theorem? Uh, the, the, the rejoinder there would be, we don't have reason not to believe. Well, we have some, you know, the other, they, 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 they are obviously biased, but so are judges. Um, so there is a sense in which we all share the same epistemic misery, uh, both, both professionals in the ju ju judicial system and lay people. Um, there actually, we have good st studies showing that, you know, the, the, the famous Israel uh, um, uh, study on, on, on cases of, of, of judges that have to decide um, cases of, uh, of uh, parole, I think, or probation. Uh, where basically uh, the, 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 the most important predictor about whether their uh, decisions to release uh, prisoners was uh, the proximity to lunchtime. Yes. Uh, so we, th there are all these studies about professionals being biased in ways that are comparable to lay people. So we have reasons to believe that they are not 
super competent uh, individually, uh, so they're not uh, uh, epistemic monsters, but, but they, they, they are roughly just as good as, uh, as, as professionals. Another way to substantiate that, because you, know, you have this fight between people who support juries and people who are against them, saying that jurors are, are dumb and then professionals know that what they're doing. Um, another way to make the argument is uh, to say that there is a high um, degree of agreement on the verdicts between judges uh, that are asked, well, what, what, do you ha what, what would your decision have been mm -hmm. in this case and the, the way in which the uh, case has actually been decided by jurors. Um, with uh, Athenian jur jurors, uh, so, so why, why yeah, yeah, how, how would breaking uh, uh, down the, how the sort of fragmentation of the Athenian jury would solve the epistemic free writing yeah. problem? Uh, Again, the, the, the sort of mechanism that I'm thinking about in the paper is uh, very hypothetical, and I'm, I'm not going, I don't think I'm going to do anything soon with the first part of the, of the paper. But the sort of thought that I have in the paper is to say that there will be some sort of epistemic competition between the groups. You want your group to be in the majority that has taken the right decision. Uh, so you, you, you basically, you have different teams that have to uh, sort of win the game, where the game is the, the right decision, and then you have some sort of emulation between, between, the, between the jurors, but obviously that's not very serious. Uh, so I don't know. Um, uh, the, the, the second point about jury deliberation and how, if deliberation is suboptimal in a way that makes it epistemically equivalent with aggregation, why not abandon jury deliberation altogether? Uh, my reply on that would be that there are two sort of epistemic problems with jury deliberation and aggregation that are sort of symmetric in the jury situation, which is that in the jury deliberation case, you have something like uh, epistemic inflation. That is, you have decisions that are apparently epistemically justified, but are actually driven by things like social pressure and informational cascades. So they, they're not fully epistemically covered. And we don't want that our final decision of the case would be a case that looks like that, that is a case driven by social pressure and informational cascades. And so having an aggregative jury next to it that doesn't have those problems, uh, and because you need both to sort of concur <coughs> on the verdict, would sort of block, not, not solve that problem, but um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, take care of pressure, both in the informational uh, sense and the social sense, being decisive uh, in the case. And symmetrically, but inversely, in the uh, aggregation case, you have what I, what I consider to be epistemically shallow verdicts, uh, because obviously there is no individual juror that can pull on whatever those, the, the views of the others uh, are. Um, and there is a sense in which uh, the deliberative verdict is not shallow. And so by having both, you sort of balance the disadvantages. But this is far from being fully spelled out. Mm -hmm. But that's the sort of thought that, yeah. why not ditch the liberation? Because you have these two sort of um, uh, flaws that would sort of... Cancel each yeah, other. Yeah. I don't know if cancel each other is the word, but something in the vicinity of that. Um, so I was very happy to, to read uh, Dave's uh, second part of the, the paper about... Uh, Counter, uh, countervailing uh, deviations. Um, and about democracy, well, I don't think that we have normative reasons, normative democratic reasons for pre preferring a multiple jury system. But uh, what I'm simply saying is that uh, for reasons that have to do with the fact that Tocqueville, Tocqueville's explanation of uh, juries is not also a justification. Uh, but I'm just saying that Democrats if you're a Democrat and you think that in this participatory sense, then you will have no reason to, 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 to oppose it. But the case remains epistemic. So yeah. yeah. Thanks. So yeah. we have about 25 minutes again for the Q&A. We can start with uh, Hélène Lombard. Uh, thank you. So I have, to, I have two questions. One is about the decision rule within the jury itself. Um, if you go to multiply juries, should you lower the, you know, the bar from unanimity to simple majority rule? And how would that affect your arguments? Um, and in fact, I wonder whether once you reintroduce the majority rule as opposed to the new unanimity, the distinction between deliberation and aggregation doesn't collapse in fact, because mm -hmm. we will have aggregation no matter what. So then the second yes. part is about, um, so you talk about the, the size. 
talk about the problem with large juries, right? The inform informational free riding at the high end. And then you talk about uh, something which is not related to size, to size, which are informational cascades. But at the low end, you also have a problem that I don't think you mentioned, which is strategic um, voting. Mm -hmm. And you can take care of it somewhat by, by secret ballot or stuff like that, but it, it is a real concern. And, and um, in small juries, you're just multiplying this problem. So on top of being very costly to have all these independent juries, and so I just I think this should be part of the, of the reflection. Yeah. And finally, I just wanted to mention there's a thing called a uh, crowd jury that's being proposed by some social entrepreneurs out there. If you Google it, you'll see what I mean. Crowd? Crowd jury. Crowded? Crowd. Like how crowd? <laughs> crowd, crowd. Crowd, crowd jury. And the idea is exactly opposite of, of yours. And I, I, I just think it would be really interesting to compare the merits in a way. It's, it's the idea of like, um, you just, um, uh, you, you, first of all, I, I, don't, I don't know how much deliberation there is, it's all online, so people never meet. Uh, they sell select like in Wikipedia to provide evidence for a bad case. Like, it's not about criminal you know, questions, it's more yeah. about there's like uh, Exxon who's doing something really bad somewhere, so they, they take pictures, they, they upload everything on the blockchain, and then, they, and then they, the, the, the system uh, randomly selects a bunch of people from, from the world. I mean, it, become this global jury, really. I don't know how many they select, actually, so it's a good question to, to look into. And then you get the results, and it's cheap, much cheaper than your solution. Um, I don't know if it works, but uh, it's, you know, it's interesting to compare. But not as if you could have multiple juries online, right? Yes, and, and you, you could actually have yeah. multiple juries, yeah. That's right. right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's really exciting, and there's a really interesting book by Adam Benforado called Unfair, uh, which sort of just mentions this idea of online. Uh, he calls it the, the, the virtual, she call, he calls it the virtual jury, but he wants that implemented in, during the trial proceedings. He doesn't talk so much about the, what happens in the jury room. So one way of doing it is sort of push the virtualization into the, into, into the jury room that, in a way that completely uh, virtualizes it. Uh, and he briefly mentions the thought of a multiple jury uh, that would sort of be uh, justified in a way that, okay, we will have multiple juries, but then we would not, would not have a system of appeal anymore uh, because we'd have enough multiple juries so that the, the decision is robust. But this is really one line. It's, yeah, it's, it's faster and, yeah, and sort of takes care of the worries that are currently taken care of via an appellate uh, structure. Um, the second, about, uh, the second point about feasibility on multiple juries, actually multiple juries exist right now in the US, not in the format that I'm suggesting, that is m two or more juries for one defendant, but there are multiple juries for several defendants. So you have cases of organized crime where uh, there are bits of evidence that are not admissible in relation to one or more of the defendants. So what happens is that you have a system of multiple jury whereby uh, all juries hear uh, some uh, <coughs> common chunks of the evidence, and then uh, when it comes to the admiss inadmissible evidence, your own jury goes out, and uh, and they don't hear the uh, the inadmissible evidence. So that that is happening, but in a different kind of uh, kind of way. Uh, the question about unanimity, I think that unanimity is a disaster. Uh, so uh, it's only the case in the the U.S. in, in the jury case. Uh, but also more generally for reasons that are indicated by Melissa Schwarzberg uh, in, in, in Counting the Many uh, and, and Whitman uh, in his uh, history of the Beyond a Reasonable Doubt standard. I think it's both, both epistemically problematic and morally uh, problematic. Um, for the same kinds of reasons that have to do with social pressure and coercing jurors into opinions that are not, uh, uh, into verdicts that are not their own. And actually there is a study showing that, uh, that occurs quite quite uh, often. So my view would be that we should go for, uh, so the way I put it in the, in the, in the first part about the uh, aggreg aggregative justification is to say, well, we should either go for a majority or a supermajority rule. And probably we'll go for a supermajority rule if we want to keep our uh, bias in favor of uh, false uh, negatives in place. So if we go for supermajority, then the two cases do not really collapse. If we go for a majority, then, then uh, they might collapse, but still we would have the liberation in place that might, in some sense, uh, bring an extra informational uh, uh, layer to the decision in the deliberative uh, scenario. And about strategic voting, I, yeah, I'm taking it more. Yeah.
Thanks. Um, I'm pretty sure I asked this question to you last year, uh, but I don't remember the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like I can't let go. So I, hope I don't remember the question. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll ask again. So uh, your paper uh, is about finding institutional design that sort of foster epistemic accuracy in regard to the juries. And you laid out at the beginning of your presentation that uh, your criterion for assessing epistemic accuracy is the truth. But it doesn't sound to me like this is what we actually ask of juries. And it also sounds to me like um, epistemic accuracy for juries is actually multiply realizable. Uh, so realizable. So it depends on you know what the verdict is. If there is jury nullification, for instance, or if the verdict is not guilty, um, you know the criterion for assessing epistemic accuracy shouldn't be uh, the same as, for instance, if the verdict is a guilty one. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just curious. I guess it doesn't. I mean, if you let go of that, it doesn't derail anything to the rest of the paper. I'm just curious. So by multiply realizable, you mean it's not binary. And so in a way that, so it's not just guilty, not guilty, but there are a bunch of other things that we might do, or? No, in the sense that there may be different standards mm -hmm. uh, of epistemic accuracy, depending on. Exactly and not just what, truth. And not just truth. Good. Yeah. And then I will just have to say that I'm taking that on board and, and counting that as an error in my, in my formulation. Because obviously, I'm not caring only about the sort of substantive truth of the matter. Right. But I'm caring about the, 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 the epistemic quality of the process whereby we reach. So when I'm talking about epistemic inflation or shallowness or whatever, I'm caring about more than uh, the truth. I'm also caring about the kind of knowledge that would substantiate the decision, the verdict, whatever yeah. the verdict would be. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, curious about, so, so as, as far as I understood, there could be cases where uh, it would be the multiple juries, it would be one jury, but it would be drawn uh, by lottery which jury you get, or you choose which jury you get. But uh, maybe I, I misunderstood. But my question is uh, uh, institutionally, it may be a question of law that, uh, but after the fact, after the decision, can the, 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 the kind of jury you were, uh, that your case was decided upon uh, by, uh, be a source of, uh, be a be included in uh, appeals. So uh, in, uh, in reasons for appeals, would that be uh, a legitimate reason? So saying I, I my, my, in the, in the randomization case here. Yeah, so let's I'm say I, my one. case was decided by uh, aggregate, but yeah. really, I, I really think that I, it, might, it would have been different than the other case, and could, could I appeal uh, on, that, uh, on that basis? Or could the state appeal on that basis? And what would the grounds be? Well, that's a, it just seems that uh, that might be a, a technical legal question that I don't really. Uh, so it, it seems that if evidence uh, are showing that in these particular kind of cases, the aggregate leads to better epistemic reasons, uh, results, then uh, if after the fact, if five years, I, I realize that my, my case was decided on that, there seems to be a reason for, uh, for redrawing the, the, or re-examining the case because the jury in that particular uh, circumstance was not the, the, the proper jury that should have decided my case. Because there was no deliberation. So that, I mean, in, in this case, so you, you were stuck with that. But you might have it the other way around, right? Uh, as well, I guess. If what I'm saying about the epistemic equivalence of the two procedures is true, and you can challenge the empirical case, of yeah. course. But if, if that is true, then I don't really see the grounds. Maybe that would be an argument in favor of going for waivability over randomization. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, but interestingly enough, it would not be, uh, it would not give you grounds for going against the multiple jury proposal, I guess. Um, so I'm happy with that. Okay. But, yeah. We have Zed in the back. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so uh, I have some results that uh, you might find interesting. Um, one which I think, I, I just like your, your response on it, which I think totally militates um, in favor of your, your project. So the first is a, there's sort of a well-known um, result that when you uh, do the quantitative jury theorem on two levels, um, you get the probability of the correct outcome actually is diminished for, uh, uh, at all stages of the kind of 
representation. And this, uh, this result goes back to at least 89. Uh, and in a paper that I've written some colleagues, uh, we, we, uh, we prove it otherwise. But it's, it's basically the same that no matter that if you do this with a multiple level, um, counter say, you always get an inferior probability of, of, of converging on the truth. Um, and so I just wonder if this kind of epistemic hit is worth the upshots um, or how much that might factor in things. Uh, the a second result that uh, we've done is we take uh, Scott uh, Pages and Lu Hong's uh, diversity trustability schema with the agents hopping along on the uh, 1D landscape, and we say, well, what if you do this in groups of in smaller groups, and then they aggregate uh, their findings, and in virtually uh, all cases, uh, the the smaller the, the this representative hierarchy produces a does at least as good, if not better. In some cases, it does. It's, in some cases, uh, depending on the protocol we use, it uh, does better each and every time uh, over a thousand months. Um, so this would indicate that, if in in terms of the, the deliberation aspect, uh, that there actually is a really good reason to uh, to dissect the, the deliberative um, means of coming out conclusions uh, because sort of by parceling out individual actors' ability to, uh, to arrive at the optimum, they're going to be able, when they come to aggregate, to actually arrive at uh, a, an, uh, an optimum which is superior to what they would otherwise have done uh, were the deliberative process uh, uh, open initially. Mm. So that would be also a, a, an argument of have in favor of having multiple deliberative yeah. groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Good. I, I will ask you for the reference. Uh, um, the 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 first uh, the first part it would sort of kill my hypothetical case in a way, right? Um, but I'm, what, what's the mechanism right there? How how come? So what's the mechanism that makes it so <coughs> that when you combine? Oh, because it just it um, it just follows straight, it follows from the the probability. So. Um, if the if the jurors each have some competency uh, p greater than 0.5, um, and uh, the probability of uh, the probability of all of the the correct outcome um, is that that it, uh, it's going to converge on one is going to be is going to be higher uh, when all nine of them vote at once rather than when you take groups of three so three groups of three um, and then. The probability of accuracy then uh, is computed uh, through the Condorcet result, where, where the underlying probability is just that of which they've aggregated. So you're 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 squishing the the yes. n, and therefore you're going to uh, you uniformly going to get a lower probability of converging on the truth. So you're wasting. Yeah. 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 You're kind of wasting yeah. sort of co yeah. like epistemic mm -hmm. uh, resources. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm interested not so much in the multiple juries, but the really interesting stuff about epistemic free writing. And I haven't studied that literature. So there's just a couple of puzzles and a, a cautionary thing about how that's supposed to work, but maybe it's in <coughs> literature. It's not exactly the same, but it's certainly in a family uh, of points about I'm just one and all the action is at the collective level. And then here's what they have in common. So I might as well either drop out or just follow the collective, right? That would cover it. So there's the rationality of why, how could it ever be rational to vote? famous thing, and then there's the, the rational ignorance problem, also a famous thing, and it seems like the epistemic free writing is in a, in a cluster in a way. But um, leaving empirical arguments aside, this is supposed to be a rational choice analytic thing, but all rational choice theory ever can say is, if people have a certain utility function and certain information, here's what they do. And here's the striking thing, they vote in droves, right? So they don't have the utility function that would have predicted that they wouldn't vote. So the cautionary thing is, if people had a certain utility function, it would be interesting what you have to postulate, then people would epistemically free ride. But we just don't know if they do. Here's a possible utility function, which there's some evidence for at the level of voting. I want to play my assigned role, just after my independent thing. People seem to be doing that in voting. I think that's what I do. It's not just people who don't understand the rational choice point that vote. Lots of even rational choice theorists uh, vote. So they must just have this other utility function, and rational choice theory doesn't criticize the utility function. So that's very general. So the other, the other, I think this goes in the direction of your comment. Uh, 
The other mechanism whereby epistemic free writing might be avoided in what I call the good faith uh, scenario, so the petit and list explanation, would be to say something like, well, we, people don't just change their views like that. They, they, they tend to stick to their, uh, to their views, and especially in a, in, a, in a jury setting. So it might be that we are prone to disagreement even when we would know that rationally the Condorcet jury theorem, <coughs> supposing that it applies, would give us reasons for free writing we just stick to our views simply because. Uh, and oh, so they, the yeah, 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 yeah. The thing is that you don't think the rational choice theory is driving anything like epistemic. Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Gloria? Briefly, and, and they, what is specific of uh, um, criminal juries in your, uh, in your paper? Because you started saying that you were. Oh, so, so, the so can we just generalize your, your, Proposals and ideas in uh, hypothetical juries to other cases, like civil cases, you mean? Or civil cases, or even I, I, I'm thinking about larger, like other decision-making processes. So, 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 but as I just said, I think we have focus groups, right? Or when we have focus groups, they typically you have multiple groups, yeah, sort of like thinking about or reasoning about the yeah. same thing. Um, but it's. So is there anything specific? I think it's it's sort of the the, the 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 order of discovery of the argument that I'm interested in jury deliberation in criminal cases. So yeah. there's nothing way more specific than that. But what is specific about the criminal jury case is that if you want to compare it to the civil case, is that in the uh, criminal case, typically in the U.S., you would only uh, take a decision on the facts, not so much on the sentence. The big problem with civil juries, identified by people like Sunstein, uh, yeah. is with the sentencing, not so much. I mean, it, it is with the yeah. facts, but it's also with the sentencing, the fact that you have you know, sort of disproportionate damages that are being decided and so on and so forth. Um, and also, I think that the evidence, the empirical case on which I'm relying doesn't <coughs> allow me to extrapolate too much. Um, so the stuff that uh, Melissa uh, Schwarzberg is doing on, on juries to sort of generalize and extrapolate, I, I find that not very convincing because there's a leap there that I, I don't think it's very well covered by the empirical basis. So, yeah. Yeah. so I don't know anything about this literature, um, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you sort of a naive question, um, which has to do with like real world juries in criminal cases. So uh, I'll start from, from a, a, an anecdote. I was called to jury service uh, a few years ago, and I was very excited uh, because you know I'm actually someone who doesn't mind missing days of work in order to see how a jury function. <laughs> so I called up my buddy in Toronto who's a criminal lawyer, and I said, I'm so excited I'm going to be on a jury. And he said, you're not going to be on a jury. And I said, no, no, they called me. I'm going to be, I'm going to be on a jury. He said, you're not going to be on a jury. Uh, Especially I, now that you're in the law school. Well, even before I was, I was in a philosophy department, and so I said, well, I'm not going to be a jury. And he said, because they're going to ask you what you do when you're going to say you're, you're an academic philosopher, and they're going to say, you know, have a good, have a good day. <laughs> uh, and I was very disappointed, because I thought, don't they want to raise the epistemic, you know, uh, <laughs> I didn't put it in these terms, right? And, uh, but I said, you know, on the contrary, why wouldn't I? And what he essentially told me was, I, namely he, as a lawyer, wants a jury that he can manipulate, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, if there's like one person who can see through my, you know, uh, weaving of a whatever, then that person is also probably somebody who's going to be rhetorically apt at convincing the other people uh, of the fact that this guy's spinning, uh, 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 and so we, we can't do our job. So, um, and he was right. I showed up, they asked me, what do, what do I do? I said, I'm an academic philosopher, and they said, have a nice day. Uh, and I, and I, I went home. And, you know, I've, I've told the story, I don't know any academic working in law, political science, philosophy, one of these areas, who has ever sat on a jury, right? They've always had the same experience that I have. So how, if at all, and, and so, but, but again, this is not just the, the anecdote is funny and whatever, but the point seems to be that they want to make the jury more manipulable. They want to, they want to reduce the epistemic uh, sort of uh, competency of the jury, it seems. So how does that, I mean, so I don't know, the, 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 I actually looked into it subsequently, and the, the rules about jury selection are very different from one country to another. It's actually a very interesting yeah. thing to do. But in a jurisdiction where there is more or less uh, sort of, you know, large scale discretion for the, for the, 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 the counsel, for, the, for the, the lawyers, to just reject people that on, on those kinds of bases, how does that relate, if at all? To what extent does your uh, model re rely on a kind of idealization 
right? That is, not, that is, that in reality is not ever going to be borne out because of another structural feature of uh, the jury thing, which is jury selection. Yeah. So I, I, the, the short answer would be there is there are several ways in which the machine is not functioning well, right? Uh, one way in which it doesn't function well is that you have a deliberation sort of process that is not doing its job properly or it's not doing its job as well as we would expect it to do its job. Um, I think there are problems with voir dire process of selection and with peremptory challenges, especially in the US. And so those are sort of reforms that would happen in parallel to the kind of proposals that I have in mind. Um, and I, I would say that they would, they would just work in parallel. Uh, obviously, we have a problem with individual, so your worry there was individual competence, I guess. So you're sort of boosting uh, the competence of, of, of the jury, uh, but also with diversity, right? I mean, there is a sense in which because academics are n never there, the, 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 the jury is not ever going to be diverse. Well, I'm, my answer to that is just... Do I, can I make a slight yeah. com small yeah. comeback? So let, let me put it in slightly less anecdotal terms. It seems to me that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a at least in an adversarial system, you have, uh, you have some agents who play a central role, namely yeah. lawyers, who are geared not towards the truth, but towards winning. winning. Sure. Right, yeah. um, and you have other actors, jury, maybe the judge, who are geared towards the truth. Yes. Now, it seems to me that you therefore have a kind of a, a latent um, conflict here of of of, uh, of, of telos, <coughs> of goal that is being pursued by the two actors. And if you put, as it were, two so how should I put it? Um, the, the, the word parallel worried me because it seems to me that you know the, 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 the complex architecture of the trial is one that's going to have to uh, find a way of, um, of, of, of establishing a balance between these two very different functions. One of which, I mean, I'm going to put it in a slightly different different way. It, it seems to me that it is a massive idealization to say of trials that they are essentially just epistemic machines, mm -hmm. right? They do a lot of other things. The rules about evidence suggest that you know uh, you could have evidence that is 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 thrown out that is massively sort of you know that is massively important for the truth, but because it um, so the whole way in which trials are constructed, the way in which lawyers are given for reasons which must have some kind of a rationale other than just you know uh, they must have some kind of a rationale. Um, I'm losing, I'm losing yeah, the third so question. My, my, my tendency would be to say, well, we have independent reasons for getting rid of things like parentary challenges and, and, and sort of we have reasons to uh, not give the possibility to lawyers anymore to sort of uh, fashion the jury in the way they, 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 they want to do that. So what, I'm interested, what, are, what were the reasons for parentary challenge to begin with? So we have reasons maybe to get away with it in order to drive it more towards the epistemic function. But surely there must be some kind of rationale that was introduced for this you know, to, for, for when this practice was introduced to begin with. I guess that the, the rationale initially was to avoid biased, uh, biased judgment. From So for example, you would have, there's, there's this story about Robert Badinter who uh, sort of stroke out a juror from a case that he was, he was in, in the defense, he was doing the defense, uh, where he stroke out a juror that was a woman because the case was about a woman who had been killed uh, it was uh, in the context of pre-Mitterrand uh, France, uh, and, and 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 actually at the end, like at the end of the trial, the guy was uh, sentenced to uh, capital punishment, and the woman came to Badinter to tell him, like, well, look, you, why why did you uh, strike me off the the, the jury? Is like because you're a woman, and sort of you would have a biased uh, judgment. And then she said, well, actually, I'm also part of a sort of NGO that uh, fights capital punishment. Uh, so she would have been the, the, the best bet. But the, the rationale there, I think, is strike out jurors that would have, in some respect, their, their judgment biased. Yeah. Can I just interject yeah. briefly? I, I was actually thinking there might be, and I don't know if it was ever the reason, but the, an, an epistemic rationale for this kind of like exclusionary move is that it's just too small. When you have 12 people, you don't, you don't get a representative sample. Of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's not irrational to a custom tailor and handpick your, your, your members. If you want. I think juries that would have a claim to representativeness would have to be a thousand people. Sure. So the Greeks had, sure. for good reasons. But we don't do that. If yep. you're going to have only 12 people, then we don't want an outlier like you, because you're not an ordinary citizen. You're, you know, you're already part of a social economic elite that if we plug, you know, 
if you, you plucked a sample of a, a thousand mm. people, I'm not even sure you'd be you know, in there. So you're in a sort of statistical oddity that I'm not sure. I, 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 that's how. Yeah. Okay. But what are the criteria of representativeness? Well, I mean, there are there are no there, there are, are no, no criteria for the the, the criteria are, are are primarily again I think have like to do with bias you know you you sort of you have a, a relative that was a victim yeah, was a similar kind of offense etc so they have to do more with judgment than with a, with a representativity there's a, yeah there's a, about representativity there's actually a very nice work by Helen Gerken uh, on second order diversity. Uh, so the idea that we would want, because at the level of you know a group of twelve people, obviously you're not going to have a, a representative, representative sample of the people. The way in which we could do that is by having second order rep uh, represent representation. That is, different kinds of juries that look in different kinds of ways. Um, so yeah, just yeah. We're just unfortunately out of time. So thank you, yeah, Andre. Thanks.